Amen. You got your Bibles? I hope you do. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. I look out today and it's a, kind of a neat day. The tilling hats are here. That's, I always love it when y'all show up, you know, and uh, they, they're long time, long time members of Grace Church, but in recent years, because of physical reasons, they've had to attend a church much closer to their house, and every blue moon, you know, they, they show up or, uh, uh, and, uh, and come back, and so I love that, and uh, that's wonderful, wonderful, and uh, let's go to 1 Peter 5 today. Uh, we're coming to the conclusion, I'm going to change the, if you religiously follow the preaching calendar that, that I publish, you'll Next week, I'm going to make a change to it. I'm going to preach on something. I'm going to add a sermon to, I think, to what we originally had, had slated for this series. I think there needs to be kind of a summation of the messages, and uh, I'm going to do that next week. And it's really going to be more of a, a call to action on some of the things that, that we've looked at and, and talked about in dealing with what are huge society issues and what the Bible says about them and how we as Christians are supposed to respond uh, to each and every one of those. And so if you've been here, you know, we've talked about abortion and we've talked about homosexuality and we've talked about sexual immorality and we've talked about uh, money matters last week and, and, and this week we're talking about um, alcohol and I'm going to kind of expand that to substance abuse and, and things like that and really talk about, you know, how, how what the Bible says about it basically and, and how we're to respond to it. And I really, I finished last week's message, and I don't know who all was, was here for that one or not, and I kind of, I came down from the pulpit, and we don't have pulpit from the stage, and I really felt like, you know, did I not just like, uh, on financial matters, did, did I not hit that one hard enough, because I really didn't, in, in all the other ones, there's been some kind of moment where there was a bold statement, and, you know, I didn't really feel like, I really came with a, a clear and, and definite challenge. And, and, and here's the deal. It, I think it's because of conviction. I really do, because I, I think it's very difficult when you live in such a blessed country that we live in to have a clear perspective on how truly how blessed we are and, and, and how we use our expendable or disposable income and things like that. There, there's a lot of matter of conviction, even for your pastor as I stand here today, uh, thinking about the kingdom of God and kingdom priorities and yet how we spend money on our families and things like that, that even I'm working through. And maybe, maybe you know, the dog had me by the seat of the pants last, last Sunday myself, and I, I confess that to you because I think it is something that we have to very, very... And I was going through my devotions this week, and, and God led me to the rich man and Lazarus, and, and, so, and, and some other passages that talked about wealth, and, and it, it really kind of put the fear into me and to reevaluate and to really be careful um, how we use our, our finances in, in the kingdom of God. And, and that's a big deal. That's a big deal. And so just I'm going to toss it out there, and I'm sharing my heart with you. Uh, allow the Holy Spirit to work on that one a little bit in your life and, and may pull your checkbook out and kind of see how, how this is happening. This is not a plea for tithing, right? Uh, but this is a plea that says it's very difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. This is, this is a plea for salvation. It really is because you can kind of see where our hearts are, you know, based on, on where our finances go. And are we really submitted to God uh, in this area? And so uh, it is a matter of salvation, and we shouldn't be so... Um, immune to really looking at our checkbooks, husbands and wives, and saying, you know, what's going on here? You know, are we really being obedient to God with, with all this stuff? So I'm not going to re-preach last Sunday's message. There you go. Uh, today, we are going to talk specifically about alcohol and what the Bible says about it. And, uh, uh, and I'm going to leave it at that. And, uh, and then we're going to go on to uh, substance abuse and, and, and things like that. And so what I have done is I'm going to let the Word of God speak for itself. And I think I say this every week. This is not a comprehensive list of verses, but it is uh, certainly uh, you'll get a taste for what the Bible says uh, about these things from these verses. And if you want to write them down and revisit them, I did not give the sound booth the, the sermon ahead of time, so they don't have these verses to put up there. So if you're, you're going to have to catch them as I go through them uh, if you'd like to reread them at some other point. Uh, but I separated them in, into two categories because there are 
there are verses that are, are pro-alcohol in the Bible, and there are verses that are con-alcohol in the Bible. And so we're going to have to look at it and see what the circumstances are and come to, to some conclusions here. And so, you know, I'm a positive guy, so I'll start with the pro-alcohol uh, stuff first. And let me, let me say again, we talk a lot about the law of love, and the law of love just says, you know, be careful today what you amen. Because especially when it comes to talking about addictions in our lives, and that we understand alcohol is, is an addictive drug, if you want to call it a drug, a substance, and there are many others. Um, there are very few of us in this room that haven't at some point in our lives been addicted to something and needed to be delivered from it. And so let's just be careful, you know, uh, how, how we treat this today because, um, you know, if not us, then someone very close to us has probably been afflicted in this way. And so let's, let's be careful as, as we move forward. But here's what the Bible says uh, in favor of alcohol. And some of these verses, actually, as I went through them, were kind of surprising to me. Uh, uh, Psalm 104, uh, and I'm taking these totally out of context. So that's why I encourage you to write them down and go back and read the context. Uh, Psalm 104, 14 and 15, uh, praise to God. He says, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate that he may bring forth food from the earth, and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. And so, uh, you, Psalmist was giving praise to God for wine that makes the heart of man glad. Interesting. Proverbs 20, verse 1. Oh wait, that one snuck into the pro, that's a con. Never mind, I'll come back to it. Proverbs 31, 6 uh, says, Give strong drink to the one who is perishing, and wine to those who are bitter in distress. And uh, I guess that's, that's someone dying on the battlefield. Give him strong drink so that you know, he's not feeling his wounds as he's about to pass. Uh, Deuteronomy 14.26. This one's interesting to me because this is, this is having to do with your tithe, your first fruits. And so uh, whenever someone would um, collect their first fruits, whether they had a vineyard or they had uh, sheep or whatever... They would gather their first fruits, and they were supposed to take the first part of that, the tithe of that, to the temple. But God said, if the temple is too far away for you to lug your first fruits all the way there, sell your first fruits, turn it into money, and bind up the money in your hand, and go to the place, the temple hadn't been built yet, go to the place that the Lord your God chooses, and spend the money for whatever you desire, oxen or sheep, wine or strong drink, whatever your appetite craves, and you shall eat there before the Lord your God and rejoice you and your household. I thought that was a, that's one of those verses I don't think I'd ever read that before. And that, that's interesting to put into our paradigm of, of worshiping God and, and the use of tithe, right? Um, we'll have to have a That's a good Sunday school class right there. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.23, we know Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, and he says, uh, No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Um, all of John chapter 2 is a passage where Jesus, his very first miracle, he goes to a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and he turns something common like water, and he turns it into wine. And I've suggested over and over again that that, that miracle is indicative of the ministry that Jesus was going to have. He was going to take that which was common and make it extraordinary. And that's what he does in our lives, right? And when we yield to him. Uh, so he turns water into wine. Uh, I would think if he created wine, he, he's actually making wine. In a way, he's giving his approval on it. It doesn't say he drank it. Um, however, if you turn to Luke chapter 7, 33 through 35, you don't got to turn there, but this next passage is uh, Jesus talking. And he's, he's kind of getting back at the Pharisees who were accusing him. Uh, and he says, For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man, Jesus, has come eating and drinking, and you say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. And so it sounds to me, the way Jesus was talking, is that he did partake of wine. That was, that was part of his, his drink, you know, that, that he would drink. And he was being accused uh, of being a drunkard, although he was never a drunkard because drunkenness is a sin, as we'll see in just a minute. Uh, now to Proverbs. Here's the cons. Here's the verses that speak against uh, alcohol, specifically in the Bible. 
And it says, wine, Proverbs 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Proverbs 22, verse, and the, the list against it is a lot longer than the list for it, and this is not a conclusive list, but trust me, it's a lot longer. Um, Proverbs 22, 20 through 21, be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and slumber will clothe them with rags. Uh, next chapter, Proverbs 23. And I love this. This next verse is really, it's really cool. 23, verses 29 to 35. And he says, who has woe? Who's got problems? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? And the answer, those who tarry long over wine, who go to try mixed wine. I guess that would be the equivalent of mixed drinks. Do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on the top of a mast. They struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. You beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. That's the battle cry of, uh, of alcoholism right there. Proverbs 31.4. And this is the, uh, the author here giving um, advice to, to his son. If it, it is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to take strong drink. And I think it goes on to say... Because they pervert justice. You know, it causes you to not think clearly, and so you do wrong things. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.3 3 and Titus 1.7 say, say that the leaders in the church uh, must not be given to much wine, must not be drunks. And the reason is that is not that there's a separate, uh, that, that there's a separate standard for leadership and everybody else. That, okay, we can't get drunk, but y'all can. Does that make sense? It's not saying that. It's that the leaders must set the example in what the behavior of everybody else ought to be and should be. The standard is the same, okay? But it's saying don't choose people that aren't living up to God's standards, and God's standard is do not become drunk. We don't need anybody in leadership that gets drunk. Um, Ephesians 5.18 clearly says, uh, and this is the definitive New Testament statement on drunkenness, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. I like it that there's a a difference there. And and I I think when you're trying to scratch an itch, you know, and and where people run to wine, uh, what God is saying, then run to God. You know, run to the Holy Spirit, you know, to to have that need met, right? Okay, we'll get into that a little later. And then Titus 2.3, this one, Titus 2.3 just blew me out of the water because I'd never read this one, okay? Um, older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, nor s- not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the younger women. Okay? So older ladies, that's for you to train the younger ladies. Um, there you go. And you can define who you are if you're older or if you're younger. Amen. <laughs> I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> there will be no sermon series coming from that verse. Uh, I'm not so worried as much about the use of wine. You know, that, that, that you, read, you heard the verses. Um, I, I think you get the gist of, of what Scripture says. Uh, what worries is the abuse of it, right? And I really don't like standing here. And, and I mean, it feels like the 6 o'clock news. And we honestly, in our house, we don't watch a lot of news just because it's just so bad, Right? Uh, it's obvious that Satan has his hand in the world when you watch the 6 o'clock news. I know they try to throw a good news in there. They throw one for every nine bad stories. I, I think they kind of ha- they know they got to do that or nobody will really want to watch. Um, in the United States, 15% of Americans are problem drinkers. And I think there is a specific de- definition. I don't have it here of what a problem drinker is. Um, while 5 to 10% of male and 3 to 5% of female drinkers could be diagnosed as alcohol-dependent, according to the National Institutes of Health. Um, A U.S. study estimated that about 30% of Americans report having an alcohol disorder at some time in their life. 
Uh, alcohol consumption more, more severely affects women than men, according to a coordinated study carried out by the researchers of Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, the Leningrad Regional Center of Addictions, and RTI International. Uh, the British Medical Association, I guess Scotland's pretty, you know, you know we kind of almost, there, there's this vibe that we want to become like Europe, right? In, in the United States, you, you know, we want to be like them, you know, and I, I've been to Europe once, and I've got friends that have gone and said, we don't want to be like them, okay? <laughs> we really don't. And, oh, they have such freedom. They do all these, you know, and, and everybody drinks beer and all this stuff. Well, um, in Scotland, which is famous for its drinking, alcohols kill six people a day in, in Scotland. It's responsible for six deaths a day. Um, the lifetime risk of alcohol use disorders for men is more than 20%, with a risk of about 15% for alcohol abuse, 10% for alcohol dependence according to the researchers from the University of California, San Diego. Um, and I did read this. Alcohol consumption, when in moderation, can have some positive effects on the health. Uh, moderate red wine drinking has several health benefits. Researchers at the University of Illinois found that injured patients with alcohol in their blood have a smaller chance of dying in the hospital. <laughs> so does that mean we got to keep like some level of red wine in our life, you, you know, at all? time just in case we get in a wreck, right? I don't amen that. I know a few of you are about to. Uh, and at the end of the article, the, the, it says the researchers said that their findings should not encourage people to drink. Okay. No. Not at all. I think they, I think they, I think they serve it there. No. Um, let me share, and this is not a pride thing at, at all. My, I want my history with alcohol and drugs. You, you should know who's talking to you today. Um, is, is is this? Uh, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. I've never even I've smelled one or two that were, weren't lit. You know, just smell what they smelled like. That's about it. And I don't like being around it. That's just me. Um, I've never used any drugs that weren't prescribed to me. I, I've never inhaled or not inhaled. I've never even been that close to it. And I do remember the first time I smelled marijuana is in the ninth grade and these dudes got on the bus with me. And I thought, that is some nasty cologne they're wearing, you know? And, <laughs> and then they started spraying brood all over themselves and I didn't get it. Uh, I figured out real quickly what that was later on. Uh, but I, it's just not been my experience. I wouldn't know where to get it. I don't know where to go. I, I've just not been around that. And I praise God for that. I mean, that's not everybody's experience in this room. I, and I know uh, and but th I'm just telling you, so you kind of know, and you may get to the end of this message and say, "Well, that dude's ignorant. That's why he said that." I'm just showing, giving you my ignorance right now. I didn't taste a drop of alcohol. I never, ever even tasted alcohol until I was 26 years old. Okay, and uh, Dana and I were dating. She comes from a home. They, they, I mean, alcohol is just part of their house. Okay, it's it's just done. Right? It's not a big deal over there in my house. Jack and Sandra, have y'all been to their house? All right. <laughs> <laughs> It's drier than the driest county that there has ever been, you know, and that's where I grew up, and, and that's fine. And I, I had some, I had some pretty deep convictions. And then as Dana and I were, were dating, you know, she she totally influenced me, and and, and you know, I broke down. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, that's me, and, and I, I'll, test, I'll testify, and, and I, I, I don't know, I mean, this depends on how you define what drunk is, okay? I will just testify, I've never been drunk. You know, I, I've never passed out, I've never drunk to the point where I couldn't just function or anything like that. I, if you ask me, you know, now, Heather, at times if I took a breathalyzer test, you know, I probably couldn't drive, you know, I'm sure. I'm sure, because that, that bar is pretty low, but I'll just share that with you. I don't think I've ever been drunk as far as what I would consider uh, being drunk. That's my testimony, okay? And uh, your testimony is your testimony. Uh, what we're really trying to get at today is, is God's Word. What does God's Word say about these things so we can abide by God's Word? Um, and so uh, what I think, though, is not only do we have to pay attention to God's Word, but we have to add to God's Word godly wisdom and personal convictions, okay? Uh, personal convictions uh, are... Are those things, well, I look at my life, I'm the, I'm the pastor of a church. God has placed me in a position of leadership. Um, 
I, I've got to be very careful how I li- lead my life because I don't want to lead. I don't want to be accused. God, God says I will be held more accountable. Okay, uh, for for what I do and what I say and how I live my life. I have that to, you know, as as, you know, personal conviction. Um, but I also, as personal conviction, I, I want to live. Um, I want to live a life before my family. I don't want my kids to, to get the wrong message and to get caught up in something that could really wreck their lives at, at, at an early age, you know. And so I'm very careful about that. So my, my convictions exceed the requirements of Scripture. Does that make sense? And you may have those. Your convictions may exceed the requirements of Scripture. And you know what? That's probably a good thing. Okay. And we've got to be very careful what kind of things we give license to in our life because they can take a good thing and make it destructive. And that's where I think not only do you have to have convictions, but you ought to have wisdom. And wisdom says that there are times when you may have the freedom to indulge in something, but wisdom says, you know what, I'm just not going to do it. This is not a smart place for me to be drinking in and to compromise myself in that way. And I, I like, it's like when the, when the Texas Rangers won the ALCS, you know, and they go back to the, to the locker room where it's usually some kind of alcohol, like champagnes being squirted around. They didn't do champagne, did they? You know, they had a separate celebration for Josh Hamilton, who was an alcoholic. They said, we're not going to put our brother through that, right? And that's wisdom. That's great. And we've got to be, that's the law of love living itself out, being sensitive to those who are around you. So that in the freedom that you have, you don't go and damage and hurt another brother. And I, I think wisdom adds to the, the requirement there, and we should all abide in that. And, and I think that's very, very wise uh, for, for each and every one of us. And I think that, that wisdom um, comes straight from Scripture. But I guess what I'm more concerned about here is what happens in our lives when a substance like alcohol, and alcohol today, because the Bible doesn't talk about drugs, you know, the Bible doesn't talk about marijuana and and methamphetamine and and all sorts of drugs, and and, uh, whether you want to call it nicotine a drug, whether you want to call all these other things drugs, things that alter our mood, things that alter, you know, and, and things that people become chemically or substance dependent on, okay, we're going to use alcohol kind of as our precept. Right, the the Bible speaks pretty clearly about that, and maybe that can give us some wisdom then into those things that the Bible doesn't talk about. Does that make sense? And so we're gonna kind of transition that way. Uh, and it's obvious some of these things have bigger effects on us. They're more controlling. Uh, they change our mood. They change our behavior. Uh, uh, you, you know, in increasing measure. Um, and, and we've got to be aware of that, and so we can't compare, it's not apples to apples in, in the comparison, but we should always exercise godly wisdom, right, when we're, when we're thinking about these things, and um, I, I, I just took a few notes, and I hope this is kind of random, I'm just going to gonna share with you, I, I think there's reasons why people um, abuse drugs and, and alcohol, and, uh, and this is mainly for you guys in the front row, but I hope most of you in, in the back row have already dealt with this, right? But it's, it's popularity and coolness, right? And it, it gets glamorized on TV. I mean, there's never been yet a beer commercial where they showed someone throwing up. <laughs> there's never been a beer commercial where they showed someone staggering around there and falling face first into the pool. I mean, you can find those videos on YouTube, I'm sure, Right? But the beer commercials themselves, they're not going to glamorize that side, that side of the abuse uh, that comes from people that are alcoholics, you know, and get really deep into that. Um, and a lot of that alcoholism comes uh, from things that they did in high school and in college and, and became dependent on that thing. And it became something that when they drank, they became cool, they became popular. And I'll tell you, it's, it's a path to destruction. And I'm sure Paul's already made you aware of that. Don't roll your eyes at me. And the message there is grow up before you get hurt. Grow up before you get hurt. And it, it, you may have a parent that partied a lot in college, or, or you may have friends, but I guarantee you with the partying comes the pain, and there's a reason they stopped doing it. And the wisdom that we, we scream at young people is learn. You don't have to experience it all. You don't have to experience the pain for yourself to make you stop. Stop before you get to the pain. Amen? amen. All right. We can amen that one. I'll, I'll, I'll let you. All right. 
uh, because the wounds from experiencing drugs and alcohol at, at an early age, uh, those stay with you. You know, the, the, those wounds st stick with you. The things you did and the things that happened to you while you were drunk and so forth, that stuff sticks with you, right? And you end up dealing with that for, for a long, long time. And we would scream at you guys and say, please don't put yourself in that kind of compromising situation just to be cool. It's not, not worth it. Satan thinks it's worth it because he wants to destroy you, but God doesn't. Um, and I, I think, and, and that's what I have to say about coolness and popularity. Uh, but, but I think for us, the, the danger, and, and maybe for our friends that we know are, are dealing with some kind of substance abuse and addiction to something, um, is, is to, we got to ask ourselves, why? You know, why, why are we addicted to that? Why are we allowing that substance, that, that thing to, to control us? You know, why have we gone there? And, and typically, I, th I think the answer is coping, right? It, it helps us. We need it. And when we find, we, when we find our, ourselves using the phrase, I need it, that ought to be a red flag, especially to the believer. And because I, I think it, our God, the Bible says his name is jealous. He doesn't want you to need it. What's he want? He wants you to need him. And so uh, turn to 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 11. And this is a verse, if you read the whole context, it's to, to leaders in the church. But uh, I hope every single one of you is an aspiring leader, right? So this applies to you. Don't disqualify yourself. If you are a leader in the church, you know, definitely pay attention to these words. Uh, definitely talking to people that are persecuted, that have a lot of things to worry about. And uh, I, I would dare say that anxiety and, and pain and, and things like that are common to man. I don't think there's an individual in this place that has not experienced some kind of deep hurt, deep pain, you know, in our lives. And, and so kind of put yourself in that mindset as we go through these verses. It says, humble yourselves, therefore. So first step number one, right? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the, hand, the mighty, picture God's mighty hand, so at the proper time he may exalt you. Step two, casting all your anxieties on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Never forget how much God cares for you. He cares. He knows every detail of your life. And he has a mighty hand that will protect you and go with you wherever you are. And he begs us here to cast our anxieties, all your anxious thoughts, those things that that before maybe drove you to a substance, you know, whatever that is, find out what the source of all that is and cast it to him. Cast your anxieties to God because he cares for you. And do this real quick, guys. Be sober-minded and be watchful. What those substances do is they numb. Remember in, the, in Proverbs when he warned Lemuel, his son, he says, you know, a ruler shouldn't be given to drunkenness because it, it, it's going to cloud your judgment. And when we are not turning to God and we're turning to substances to, to help us cope, what happens then is we are numbed and we become blinded to what is really happening here. And he says, be sober-minded. Don't be drunk-minded. Be watchful because you have an adversary. That means you've got somebody that is against you. You have a real, living, breathing adversary, the devil. Now, I don't know what you picture when you picture the devil. Is it the little dude on your shoulder with a pitchfork, you know, that you can kind of brush off with your hand? That is a terrible, wrong, unsober-minded picture of who he is, okay? That is an ignorant picture of who the devil is, okay? Okay? The, the more proper picture is found right here in the next few words. It says, um, he prowls around like a roaring lion. Now, a lion is a huge beast. And I, 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 there's some pictures on the internet where people have made friends with lions. It's not talking about that lion, right? It's talking about a wild lion. And a lion in the wild is fast and is powerful and you would have no chance whatsoever in a fight against that lion okay you have no chance 
And so what he's characterizing the devil as is a powerful adversary that's fast and cunning and stealthful and powerful against which none of us in this room have a chance against him. And we should be sober-minded and we should know that our enemy is out there prowling around like a roaring lion seeking who? Someone to devour. Okay? He's seeking someone to devour. And that someone, insert your name. Insert your husband's name. Insert your wife's name. Insert your children's names. Insert your grandchildren's names. Insert your church. Okay? He's out there. Put those names in there and make it real. Be sober. You should not leave here today without an awareness that you have an adversary in the devil and he hates you and he will do everything he can to destroy your life, especially as we're talking about today through substance abuse and dependency on anything else. He wants you to depend, be dependent on anything else except God. And here Peter begs us, cast your cares upon him. Okay? Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Cast your anxieties. And verse 9 says, Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you, after you suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever and ever. Let me sum that up with another verse. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so King David goes to, to fight Goliath. Ten foot tall giant, mighty warrior experienced in battle, huge sword, shield. He's got all the armor. David goes out there with no armor and a slingshot. Little boy, undersized. Why? If you go back, yeah, he's backed by God. You go back to the verses before when he's talking to Saul, and he says, you know what? I have slain the bear, and I have slain the lion with what? Bare hands, the Bible says. Now, we had the privilege this morning at Sunday school having two, two vet, I wanted to call you veterans. What are you? Vet, veterinarians. I got I had, a, had a syllable. It's a diphthong. Um. We had two veterinarians in there to talk to us about the power and the, just the natural power, strength, stamina that bears and lions have. I mean, it's incredible compared to you and to me. We are nothing compared to a bear or a lion. And here David has given testimony that he has slain both the bear and the lion with his own two hands. And there's only one other person I know that's done that. That's Samson in the Bible. And Samson and David had one thing in common. God. You understand? Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion trying to, to bait you into to finding um, peace, to finding hope to finding escape from your anxieties in your life through some kind of substance, a substance that will eventually lead to your destruction. That's the enemy's plan. And he says, you cannot get out of this. It's like a chain that's wrapped around us that we are bound to. But we say, or Peter is saying here, God, who has the mighty right hand, don't underestimate God's strength, can break that chain. And he can help you slay the lion, the dragon, the bear. Does that make sense? Amen. How does he do that? Well, we humble ourselves. We cast all our cares and anxieties on him. We're, we're privileged um, in, our, in our church. And I've really grown to, to love this man. It's Joe in, in the back there. And Joe is a substance abuse counselor. And... Uh, what I really appreciate about Joe, we, we go and we, we talk a lot, and, and uh, uh, Joe understands the, the relationship between um, God spirit, and, and, and having a, a, a relationship with God in, in, as a part of your healing process, right? And, and here's, how, here's what I tell people, you know, if, if I came staggering, and, and there's a fine fine line here that, that I'm going to walk, and I, and I hope I walk it with all wisdom right here before you. But if, if I were to walk in through that door uh, just bleeding, c completely wounded, so I, I had been hit by a car, and uh, my bone in my leg is, is 
sticking out through through the skin, and uh, and I walked in. I, I could I could just sit here and I could say to y'all, you know, uh, just just give me a painkiller, you know. So as long as I don't feel it, I'm I'm all right, and, and that's not very sober-minded, is it? Right. As long as I don't feel it, I I can medicate away the pain. But the broken bone is still sticking out of my leg, and. And, 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 and I, I, I might be able to pray. And I, sure, God could zap my leg. and he, I mean, Jesus did, did an amazing thing. But you know what God has also done is given us guys like Joe. Now, if Joe came up and he, he shared his testimony, his testimony would be vastly different than mine. But you know what? God has equipped Joe to heal people in a way that I can't do. Amen. I'm thankful for doctors. I'm thankful for the veterinarians that heal our dogs and our cats, right? Uh, and I'm thankful for the medical doctors down at the ER that, that help us there with medical problems. But you know what? There's a whole other set of doctors that heal wounds that people don't see with the eye. And they're just as bad and bad and as a broken bone sticking out of someone's legs. And those are wounds that happen in our hearts. And it's usually those wounds that drive us towards substances that numb the pain. And I tell you what, there is some kind of stigma the, that... We, we feel like there's a shame in going to that kind of doctor. And I, I would say, be sure, if you ever go to that kind of doctor, that they love Jesus. I think they, they've got to involve a, a spiritual, that God has always got to be in the, in, the, in the mix. Because if I was really sick, I would want every single one of you to pray for me as I went to my doctor. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay? And it's not that... There's a whole slew of Christianity that says if you go to a doctor, you don't really have faith in God. No, God has gifted and equipped them, okay? I believe that. But I also want to go in prayer. And I believe the same thing. We cannot help, we cannot even hope to find healing if God is not somewhere involved in, in that process. We do not exclude God, you know, to, to go to counseling, right? We involve him in that, and then the, I think that just maximizes the healing of what, of what God can do. Do not underestimate the devil. Um, Paul says, and I conclude with this, I don't even know what the time is. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, um, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. When I mix that verse with what Peter said earlier about your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking to some devour. That is his purpose, to, be, to dominate me. And I realize something that characterizes Satan. And if you can put your finger, if he's got something in your life like this, put your finger on it. Right, allow the Holy Spirit to put his finger on it right now. Because you might even be ignorant to it, right? Is that Satan is all about control. God is all about love. And Satan is all about control. And so when we talk about satanic stuff, when you talk about even the horror movies that are like based on demonic things, Satan's always doing one thing, possessing people, right? Have you ever heard of a Christian being possessed by God? God does not do that, okay? Satan possesses Satan controls, Satan dominates, he does all these things, he gets, gets people addicted to stuff where you say that I cannot stop. And he wants you to turn to those things that control you with one purpose in mind, that he can destroy you, he wants to devour you. That is his only goal. He knows his fate and he's going to take as many people down with him as he can. Don't let your name be inserted in that list. But I also realized this, as I said before, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You see, God's about freedom. And be careful when we say things tritely in the church that have great significance, like God is good all the time. No, he really is good, guys. Let's not just say that because it's because we're conditioned to say it. But he whom the sun sets free is truly free. Okay? We say that a lot, too. He whom the sun sets free is truly free. See, God is about freedom. And it says, no one can pluck you out of my hand. Remember that verse? 
No one can pluck you out of the Father's hand. But let me tell you how God loves you. He loves you with an open hand. He does. He loves you with an open hand. You can pluck yourself out. You can run off. And if God controls anything in our life, it's because we've yielded that control to Him voluntarily and we've become His servants. Does that make sense? God is all about freedom. God does not put a chain on anybody. We come to Him willfully. We come to Him freely. We abide. We stay in Him freely of our own choosing because every day when we wake up, we choose to love Him. And then when we choose to love Him, His power is available in our lives. And when His power comes into our lives, it truly sets us free from everything, including addictions. Does that make sense? We serve a good God. And I submit this to you, to you today. If you're controlled by anything or anyone, there's not love in that. And you can be controlled by things in your past. You can be controlled by a physical person. You can be controlled by an addiction. But behind all those things, you know, uh, I think it's Peter again that said, we don't battle against flesh and blood. It's not that person that's controlling you. It's not that substance that's controlling you. Ultimately, it's your enemy. And you can only fight your enemy spiritually. And I invite you this morning, if you'd stand with me, we'll close our service out. With an opportunity to do that spiritual battle. I believe our God is a God that sets people free. And it might just be today you need to be set free from something. Maybe God has put his finger on something. Uh... Today is the day to get that done. If you walk out of here bound, that's your choice. But God has said, you know, let, let's, let's start laying some chains down at, at the altar, and maybe today is your opportunity to do that. But maybe too, and I believe in knocking on heaven's door, you've got a friend that needs to be prayed for because his adversary or her adversary has got them in the, in the grasp of something that we've talked about today, and you want to come down and start praying for them and maybe gather someone that can... Grab someone's arm and pull them down to the altar with you and say, hey, pray for me because we're going to go down and we're going to pray for Johnny because Johnny needs this. And you know what? Your prayers, the Bible says, the prayers of a righteous man or woman are powerful and effective. Don't underestimate what God can do when you really begin to cry out for him. And so uh, let's bow our heads. And if the Holy Spirit's talking to you today, I invite you to be obedient and to be obedient immediately. Don't hesitate. Let me pray for you. And then when I say amen, if God's calling you to come down to the altar, you do that. Jesus, we thank you today that you are a God that, set, that sets us free. When you died on the cross, you overcame so much. You overcame sin so we can have forgiveness and we would not be bound by sin. But God, the power that overcomes sin is the same power that overcomes anything Thing, any plan, any substance that Satan has had us go to and run to instead of you. And so God, I pray that today that there would be people in this room, all over the room, that find freedom in you as we cast our cares upon you. God, help us to be obedient in Jesus' name. Amen. If God's calling you to come and pray, you come and pray.